I invite you now to remain standing as we hear today's gospel lesson from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter. That evening at sunset, people brought to Jesus those who were sick or demon-possessed. The whole town gathered near the door. He healed many who were sick with all kinds of diseases, and he threw out many demons. But he didn't let the demons speak because they recognized him. Early in the morning, well before sunrise, Jesus rose and went to a deserted place where he could be alone in prayer. Simon and those with him tracked him down. When they found him, they told him, Everyone is looking for you. And he replied, Let's head in the other direction to the nearby villages so I can preach there too. That's why I've come. He traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and throwing out demons. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, as I continue in this sermon series that we started last week on resetting our lives in this new year, I want us to focus on resetting our purpose. So often, I think we are resembling the story that the great preacher Fred Craddock once told. He said he went to visit a dear family in Connecticut one year, and he had a wonderful dinner with the family. And after dinner, they sat in the living room for a while, and he watched his friend's children playing and rolling on the floor with a greyhound that they had recently adopted. After a while, the couple excused themselves, and they said, we need to go and put the children to bed. We had this little routine where we both read stories to them and tuck them in. Um, if you are okay with it, just stay here in the living room for a while, and we'll be back in a few moments. So Fred was fine with that to get a few minutes of quiet as he sat there by their fire and looking at the dog laying on the floor and reminiscing about how much fun it was to play with a dog. And all of a sudden, the greyhound stood up and looked at Fred and said, Is this your first visit to Connecticut? And Fred said, well, no, actually, I went to school here. And how about you? I understand that you just recently retired from racing. And the dog said, what, retired? Is that what they told you? No, I didn't retire. I tell you, I ran for years and years and years professionally, running around that track, trying to chase that rabbit and catch that rabbit till finally one time I got close enough to that rabbit and I found out it was a fake. I didn't retire, I quit. My life was meaningless. I spent all that time chasing something that wasn't even real. Fred sat back and he said, hmm, that's a parable for a lot of our lives. We get so busy running around with an activity, chasing after something that doesn't have real meaning in life. Well, the great Stephen Covey wrote a book that many of you read many years ago like I did, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he says to have a meaningful life, we need to start at the end. Look at our lives from the end. What kind of a legacy do we want to live? What kind of legacy do we want to leave in this world? What meaning has our life meant on this earth through all the years that we have spent here? What have we been chasing after? What has been the purpose of our lives? What values have we imparted? What values have we lived? And are we living out those values right now, today? We're going to talk more about resetting our values next week and how they can add purpose and meaning to our lives. But today I want to ask you, when you get to the end of your life, will you have any regrets? 
Will your life be filled more with regrets than they are with praises and joys? What will your friends say about you? What will your loved ones say about you? You know, the sad reality is we had two wonderful saints in the life of this church who passed away just recently, Nell Peterson and Sarah Threat. Dear saintly women, and I often ask families if they had one word to describe their loved one's life, what would that one word be? So I want to ask you, if people described your life in one word, what word would that be? What purpose and meaning are you following in life right now? In 1962, Claire Booth Luce was the first woman to serve in the U.S. Congress, and she offered advice to President John F. Kennedy at the time. She said, a great man is a sentence. Abraham Lincoln's sentence was, he preserved the union and freed the slaves. Franklin Roosevelt's sentence was, he lifted us up out of the Great Depression and helped us win a world war. Luce feared that Kennedy's attention was so splintered among different priorities that his sentence risked becoming a muddled paragraph. What word would describe your life? What sentence would describe your life? Former pro football pro Bubba Smith. Anybody remember Bubba Smith? A few of you. Yeah, a little, a little before my time in watching football, but he came face to face with his sentence many years ago, and he didn't like it. He came into Providence at Michigan State University as an all-American defensive end. He was the first selection in the 1967 NFL draft, and he played for nine years pro football. He was named to two Pro Bowls, and he was first-team All-Pro in 1971. But after football, he and other NFL veterans decided to enter showbiz and get involved in television commercials. He played an inept golfer and polo player in television commercials for Miller Lite Beer. In one of those commercials, he looks into the camera, holding up his can of beer, and he pops the top, and he says, I also love the easy opening cans. And he smiled his big grin. Well, Smith walked away from doing those commercials because he said he didn't like the effect that drinking had on people. And he realized that he was contributing to a significant social problem in our world. In a magazine article about his life, Bubba Smith said that neither beer nor any other alcoholic beverage had been a part of his own personal life. And yet he agreed to do those commercials because it was good money. It was an enjoyable job. Until one day, when he went back to Michigan State University, he went back as the Grand Marshal for their homecoming parade. As he was riding in the limousine at the head of the parade, he saw throngs of people lined up on each side of the road. And on one side, the people were shouting, Taste great! And on the other side, they were shouting, Less filling! Because that was the tagline for Miller Lite Beer. Taste great, less filling. He realized that he had become very popular because of those television commercials, that they had a great impact upon the students at Michigan State University. But later, when Bubba was in Fort Lauderdale during spring break, he saw a group of drunken college students on the beach, and they started shouting to him, Tastes great, less filling. Tastes great, less filling. 
and immediately he called and withdrew his contract with Miller Beer. He said he realized that his influence upon those children was not one that he wanted to live with any longer. He said there was this still small voice inside of his head that kept saying, stop, Bubba, stop, stop doing that. He said, I don't want my legacy to be taste great, less filling. How sad it is to get to the end of your life and to think that what people remember you for is something that you're not proud of. Here are some sentences that maybe you do want to be remembered for. He was a great father. She was a wise and caring mother. He was a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, we all want to be remembered for something, and we all will be remembered for something. Even Jesus himself wanted us to remember him. That's why he gave us the Lord's Supper. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Remember Jesus as you break the bread and as you drink from the cup. We all want to be remembered. It's part of our DNA that God designed in us to be community with one another and to influence one another's lives. On this Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, many people are remembering Martin Luther King Jr.'s life, but I wonder what they remember about him most. At the conclusion of the last sermon that he ever preached, the day before he was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, Martin Luther King said, I want you to be able to say that day, the day of my funeral, that I did try to feed the hungry. I want you to be able to say that I did try in my life to clothe the naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try to visit those in prison. And I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Those words, my friends, echo the words of Jesus when he said, when you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. The driving force in Martin Luther King Jr.'s life was his strong belief in Jesus Christ. Amid all the other voices and hatred in the world, what motivated him most was following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Is that what motivates your purpose in life? Following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ? Is that how people will remember you that you did unto others as Christ has done unto you? What will your legacy be? What one word and one sentence will define your life? And are you living right now in ways that will help to make that true? Pastor J.R. Miller compares our lives to following God's wisdom in life. And he says that so many of us don't live our lives on purpose. Instead, he says this, he says, we often ask God for wisdom and guidance, but we've already planned how we're going to build our lives and what we're going to do. We're really just asking God to bless our plans. Are you guilty of that? Am I guilty of that? So much of our American culture tells us to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and to believe in our own independence and our gifts and our strengths. But those gifts and strengths, my friends, come from God. Jesus understood the pull of the crowds, the crowds to define us and the crowds to tell us what to do with our life. In the scripture lesson that we read today, it is early in Jesus' ministry. He is in Galilee, and he has been healing the sick, and he has been casting out demons. He has been busy, and people like that busyness. They like what they see that Jesus is doing. But Jesus rises early in the morning, and he goes away to a quiet place to spend time in prayer, I think, to reset his priorities, 
to reset his purpose. Instead of being pulled away by that crowd of people who wanted him to continue ministering in that town, he pulled away and reminded himself that his father had sent him for love of the entire world, not just that one community. He pulls away, and his disciples come looking for him, and they say, don't you know everybody's looking for you? Come on back. Come on back. The crowds are gathering. They're hungry for you. And did you notice what Jesus said? He said, let's go somewhere else. I've got work to do somewhere else. This is why I have been called. Jesus was clear about his purpose in life. His purpose in life was to spread God's message of love everywhere so that all people might know. As John 3.16 proclaims, for God so loved the world, not one race, not one country, not one community, not one gender, not one anything, all the world, inclusive of everyone. You know, so often we look at those great commandments that Jesus gave us to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. And we don't realize that the two are really intricately connected. We can love neighbor in ways that don't bespeak true love and selfless love. We can do acts of mercy and kindness without really caring deeply about our neighbor, doing them out of obligation and duty. But if we love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, then we will, like Jesus, be able to see the reflection of God's image in every person that we meet. Regardless of race, regardless of country, regardless of gender or sexual orientation, we will see Christ in everyone that we meet. Our true purpose in life, my friends, is the purpose that Christ has given to us to carry on the ministry of building God's kingdom here to seek and to find God's kingdom in our midst by seeing one another as Christ, by reaching out in love. Again, I say Martin Luther King Jr. built his ministry upon following that great commandment of loving God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving neighbor as himself. Here at Washington Street United Methodist Church, we have been called to carry on that legacy. And just as I've asked us to think about our purpose as individuals, our church council will be meeting on Sunday to look at our direction for this new year. And I ask our church council members that question. What one sentence would people in this community use to describe this church? And what role do each one of us have in fulfilling that purpose? Being those in this community who can be lights and beacons of God's love and God's grace. May it be so for you and for me in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.